Oh, good morning. Come on, somebody, rise up. I, I like, I, I don't like, I think I love the title of this series because it fits me well. It, it's, it's one of those things that compels you to do something, like rise up. When, when just those words, rise up, it, 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 there's a mandate on those words. And I, I don't know what area or what place or what circumstance, what situation is in your life to cause you to rise up in this season. But I want to tell you that God has empowered you to rise up, that God has equipped you to rise up, that God has positioned you to rise up. And, and, and you know, I think I would miss something today if I didn't did just give honor where honor is due. And that is to your pastors, Pastor Scott, Pastor Michelle, thank you for your love, for your grace. You know, there are no two more encouraging people than these two people on the planet. Amen? And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You know why I like doing that? I like doing that because I think you should always honor the spiritual leadership of the house. But also I like it because it makes Michelle squirm a little bit, like, encourage her, love on her. It's like, oh, I just want to help somebody. Don't help me, I'll help you. But I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you guys and the blessing you've been in my life personally for the last eight months. You know, eight months ago, I moved to the Bay Area. A lot of you know that. But, you know, I, I love it because seasons don't begin and end in time. We think time is everything because we think, well, well, you know, summer is coming, winter's ending, fall, spring. We think it's about time. But I'll tell you this, that seasons begin and end through relationships. Seasons of our life will always begin and end in relationships. You meet someone new. It's not just we, we change from Tucson to the Bay Area, but what has made the season the season isn't living in an area. It's meeting the right people. It's having the right relationships. It's understanding that there are some relationships that have ended or some seasons that have ended in our life and then some seasons that we are called to rise up to. That, that we're to rise up to them because I'm convinced that God puts seasons of your life. Sorry, I've got to put this in the My OCD's kicking in. I'm like, we're middle, right? Any, anyone out there notice that? I just was fixing because we're not perfect, right? Just willing to be perfected. We're, we're, we don't have it all together. We, we don't have it all set. No one has arrived. But I love that Jesus has arrived. That his power, that his presence, that his authority in our life positions us to rise up. And if not careful, I will be comfortable living where I've always lived, doing what I've always done, but how many know there's something in our heart that longs for more? We, we want more. If there's someone in the Bible that wanted more, it would be Joshua. Joshua was someone when Moses went to the tent of meetings and met with God, Moses would go in and it said that Joshua would stay out because Moses was the only one allowed to go into the tent of meetings. And when Moses would go into the tent of meetings, Israel would stand outside their tents and wait for the word that God was going to speak to Israel. There, there was a reverence, there was an awaiting, there was an awe. But I love it, it said that when Moses left the tent of meetings, Joshua stayed. He, he stayed. He couldn't go in, but he got as close as he could. He just wanted more. And when you have an appetite for more, God opens up more. When, when you have a hunger, God, I know I don't have it wired. I know I'm not perfect. I, I know maybe I don't have the words to speak or, or the actions to follow at times, but I just want to declare that I want more of you. I want more. I, I want more. I, I need more. I'm, I'm hungry for more. And so Joshua follows Moses most of the days of his life, and he, he, is, he is a great follower, which creates in him to become a great leader. In Joshua chapter 1, 
there is a transition. Say transition. There's a seasonal change that happens in the life of Israel. And it portrays to the leadership. Moses passes and Joshua rises. I think that's, that, that, that is what must happen in life. I'm watching as I get older, my son is rising up. He's got ideas like, Dad, I don't think we should do it that way. I'm thinking, well, I didn't ask you what we should do. I just need your help to do it. But if I will pause and listen to the next generation, there is some wisdom. There's insight. It's funny, and I, I, I want to be quick, but I, the other day I wanted to buy a cool shirt because I just turned old. <laughs> I just turned 50 on May 8th, and I was like, you know when you're old is when you call your daughter and I'm like, hey, Mariah, I'm thinking about you coming out. You know, it's Mother's Day. You know my birthday. I turned 50. She's like, what? Wait, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, Mother's Day's on the toilet. She's like, I don't care about, you're dead. You're not 50. And it wasn't like, you're not 50. Like, I'm encouraging you. You're like, it's like, oh my God, you're 50. <laughs> Dad, it was so good you being my father. Yeah, I'm like, well, I'm not going anywhere, Mariah. I'm still alive. I'm still moving. I still got some fire in the bones. She's like, I thought you were 42. I said, that's why you're my favorite. <laughs> Joshua is in a moment to rise up. You know what I love about rising up is Joshua didn't chose the moment. God chose the moment. God... I know you could think that your pastors are choosing a moment to rise up as a church, but can I, can I tell you something? God has chosen this moment for Cornerstone. God has chosen this moment for this church to rise up, to go to new places, to believe for new things, to, to declare for facility and land and, and, and the finances and everything that it takes on the physical side, but there's something in our spirit that says, no, that's right. There's something, there's more. I, 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 I want to come after what's next. It says this in verse 1, after the death of, of, of Moses, the servant of the Lord. The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised to. Who? I, I promised it to Moses. I love it because God is what? The same yesterday, today, and forever. What he promised, he will always promise. What he has done, he will always do. How he will love, he will always love. How he's forgiven, he will always forgive. And I love how God reminds Joshua, remember when you and Caleb snuck into the promised land and climbed that hill and saw the fruit of Canaan? You saw, you saw the possibilities why 10 others saw the giants. You saw what I could do. They saw who, 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 who was going to defeat them. They saw the physical. You saw the possibility. This is your moment, Joshua. Rise up. Rise up into the next season of your life. Rise up into what God has for you. But I love it because when God works in somebody's life, everyone benefits from it. Come on, let's be honest. When you got saved, everyone benefited from it. And if they didn't, you should probably get saved again. When we get our life right with God, it's not just our life that benefits, it's everyone that is around us that benefits. When God is moving, there's a beneficial factor that changes the environment. It, it changes the atmosphere and how you live. Things how you once lived, the old things. God is saying this, and, and I don't mean this in a negative or a cruel way, but he literally says, Moses is dead. Get on with it. I'm like, well, God, could we just pause for Moses for a moment? But God isn't interested in what was. He's interested in what he promised. And this is what he's saying to Joshua. Joshua, 
do you want what I've promised you? I'm not talking about do you want to have a conversation about it, but Joshua, are you willing to go after it? Because in chapter 1, eight different times, God speaks these words to Joshua. Joshua, be strong and courageous. Hey, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Joshua, I'm going to do great things, but be strong and courageous. Because it's the moment that we say yes to God and the circumstances close in, we have the tendency to say, well, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. That was a great idea Sunday, but now it's Thursday. And if this guy doesn't get out of my way, I'm going to need to get baptized again on Sunday. That, that our actions have to operate in the direction of the promise. That God's promise for our life, promise for our family, if not careful, you will continue to try to resuscitate the old, no, we got to get Moses back. But Moses' season was done. If not careful, we fuel yesterday's pain. Yesterday's disappointment. We continue to talk about what was or what wasn't or what could have been or what should have been instead of turning our attention and declaring what is coming, what God is going to do, what God wants to work and how God wants to work it how God wants to stir up our heart. You know, there's some major differences of the people that Joshua led and the people that Moses led. I love Israel, and God loved Israel, but God brought Israel out of Egypt. They were, they were enslaved in Egypt. He brings them out, but he could never get Egypt out of them. He, he got them into the promise. Can I tell you something? God's not just trying to save you. God's trying to encourage you, restore you. He's trying to create within you a new thing, a new thing. The old is gone, the new has come. Then I want to live in the newness. I want to rise up in the newness of who God is in my life. I don't want to have, have a resemblance of Christ, but still be dealing with yesterday. Have a gone that I talk about is the wholeness of my life, but I'm still bitter about 20 years ago. And so I keep fueling what was instead of declaring what is coming, what is declaring of what God wants to do, how God wants to do it, and, and, and in the manner in which God wants to do. I, I love one of the things of Joshua. When God comes and speaks to Joshua, Joshua turns in verse 5 and begins to declare over the people. It, it, it's, it's, it's an order that is so powerful. And it's not just the order for a, a pastor or a leader. It is the order for a son of God. It is the order for a father to hear or a mother to hear. Because when God speaks to Joshua, Joshua then turns in verse 5 and says, and Joshua told the people, consecrate yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things. Consecrate yourself for tomorrow God will do amazing things. Why is that? Well, why is that so quick in the life of Joshua? Because when he heard it, he wanted to declare it. Some people have a system where they have a hesitation in their life. God says something, they hesitate. Can I tell you something? When you live with a hesitation always, you'll talk yourself out of something great. You ever... Think about doing something. Man, we're going to go on this trip. We're going to do this. And then you start thinking about what it's going to cost. You're like, yeah, maybe we'll just go to McDonald's. <laughs> you know why? Because McDonald's is comfortable. It's easy. Well, I wouldn't say it's comfortable, but it's easy. I mean, you can be through the drive-thru in 12 seconds, back home in 10 minutes, watching TV and doing nothing. But to do something, it will cost you. It will cost you planning and believing to achieve what God has put in your heart. What God has put in your heart isn't going to happen because God wants it to happen. That's a given. What God's put in your heart, what God's put in this church, what God's placed in the vision of this leadership is going to happen because we choose to make it happen. We step in and we begin to become declarers. God speaks to 
to, to Joshua. Joshua, I'm going to do some amazing things tomorrow. Joshua, get, oh man, that is, God, I can't wait. Hey, Israel, God's going to do amazing things tomorrow. You know what I love about the generation that followed Joshua? Is, is they yelled back, yeah, God's going to do amazing things tomorrow. We can't wait. See, that's what I love about the generation of Joshua. The generation of Joshua were, were encouragers. Where Moses, the generation, were murmurers. God's going to do some great things. I doubt it. <laughs> Remember when Moses went up on the mountain and God wrote on stone, literally like got his finger out and wrote Ten Commandments out on stone. And he brings them back. You know, Charles and Heston comes off the mountain. He's like, thus saith the Lord. And they're like, eh, I've seen better. Murmur. Man, God wants to do amazing things. Either you'll have a murmur or you'll become an encourager. Are, are you encouraging the things of God and the people that are around you? Or are you murmuring? You know, when I told my daughter I was 50, I was looking for some encouragement. You ever ask someone, like, like you're baiting them? Like, yeah, well, you know, I'm turning 50. Dad, you don't look a day over 30. You know, that's what I'm wanting. I didn't, I wasn't really looking for like, oh my God. <laughs> Gonna make the arrangements for you, Dad. You have nothing to worry about. <laughs> no, you're baiting them like, no, this is when you say, Dad, you're amazing. No, you're, inc I, no, cut it out. Seriously. <laughs> because all of us need somebody to believe in our dream. All of us need somebody, but can I ask you, are you that somebody? I know I need somebody, but I need to become somebody, somebody. Can you follow that one? I, I want to become that voice that continues to declare, because if I'm going to rise up, if I'm going to do something, if I'm going to step into what God has for me, then I've got to declare the great things that God is doing Joshua began to declare, God is going to do amazing things. Get ready. Consecrate yourselves. Get ready. Get your kids close. Get, 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 get all your stuff together because tomorrow everything changes. Tomorrow we're going to the Jordan. Tomorrow we're going to step into the promises. Man, we've lived in provision, but I want promise. I don't want to just be saved. Man, I want God to do something. God didn't just take my life out of something. See, that's what we can think is, well, God brought me out of darkness into light. No, no, God didn't take me for something. He brought me into something. When he brings me in something, it should motivate me to move forward. It should motivate me that greater is he who is in me, that, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It, it motivates me. When God looks at Joshua and says, Moses is dead, I'm sorry what you loved is past, but, but, but there's more, Joshua. There, there's more. What you saw, what you believed, what you declared wasn't just a good idea. It was my idea. And, and I love it because here's what happens is when he starts to declare, people start declaring. Can I tell you something? Can... When, when, you, when you, let me, let me say it the right way, because it can sound harsh, but if you're not an encourager, if you're a discourager, you will find that you will draw discouragers in your life. Discouragers run in packs. Oh, yeah. If you don't know that, they make phone calls as soon as something happens. Oh, did you hear about this? Oh, yeah, I heard about that. They get on social media. They post things that no one should ever post. You ever read something and you're like, man, they're going to regret that tomorrow. Like I regret it. And they're probably not because they don't care. But you know what I love is encouragers run in pack. Why? Because you'll draw who you are. There, there is something that the law of attraction in your life. When you start speaking life, you'll find life. When you start speaking hope, you'll find hope. When you start giving grace, you'll find grace. When you start giving love, you'll find love. It, it's, it's, it's 
it's, it's the principle of the kingdom. What I sow, I reap. So if I get frustrated with the people around me, I should probably just become frustrated with who I become. Because I'm the one who's attracting those that are surrounding me. Joshua, it's amazing. Joshua was always someone that was yes for God. And there was a generation that riled, rallied beyond, uh, around him that said yes. You want to go to the promises? Yes. You want to overcome Jericho? Yes. Do you want to become circumcised? Okay. See, we, we want all the good yeses, right? Oh, God's going to bring blessings. God's going to, okay, God's going to do some cutting. Uh, I'm going to be out of town that week. Because we want to go somewhere. But to go somewhere you've never gone, you've got to do some things you've never done. That when we rise up, that, that there's, there's a spirit in us that when we rise up, we're willing to start something that only God can finish. That's what happens with Israel, right? They step into the waters of the Jordan at flood season. There's no way they can get across it, but they wanted to begin something. By faith, they started something that they could not complete. Can I tell you something? As a church in faith, we start things that we may not have all the answers to get to the other side, but God knows that we're getting to the other side. Sometimes you got to just get off the edge and step into the waters of faith. To believe that God has something more for your life. In Joshua 3, 14, it says this. It says, so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage. Can I tell you something? Every time God asks you to do something, there will be a problem in doing it. There will always be a why not. This is the moment where murmurers find their gift to be the greatest. And the Jordan is at flood stage. What? Why are we going in February? We should go in June. It'll be a drought. We could jump across it in June. Why now? Because God said now. Be because God wants this moment. God wants to get praise in our moment. Not just to make moments for us. And it says, now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priest, say as soon. I, I love this. As soon as the priest who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing and it piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. Watch what happens is, is God says, you are not going to be a provisional people, but a promised people. I, I don't want to just be welfare mentality where I give you everything. I want you to partner with me to do something. I don't want you just to wonder in the desert. I want you to wonder about how great I am. I want you to have a wonder of the amazing God that you serve. I want you to have a wonder of what you could do and what could be accomplished through me. I, I want you to really set in and partner because every time to that point, Moses stepped forward, got out the staff, right? Touched the water, boom. This time God said, no, you're going to get in the water. Well, well, Moses didn't make us get in. Well, too bad. I ain't Moses. I want you to get in the water. I want you to believe with me. I want you to work with me. I, I want to partner with you, Israel. And when you stepped in, it says as soon as they stepped in, the waters, a great distance, they could not see it, but they were still believing it. See, when you begin to rise up, there will be a maturity to step into things that you can't see, but you'll believe. You'll believe that God is doing the miracle even though it hasn't got to you yet. And, and I love it because... The, the, the guys that are carrying the ark are the only ones. Listen, those that are carrying the presence of God are the only ones that get into the water. There's got to be those that are willing, churches that are willing to get into the current of life so that we can bring other people that don't know God, that are lost from God, that are struggling with God, into the waters 
that take them to the promise of who God is in their life. There's got to be some people that are willing in the church to say, no, 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 I'm going to step in. I'm going to step beyond. Because you know what? Everyone's a critic on the shore. You ever notice that? You ever watch a game and you become a critic? Oh, man. I mean, I was watching the Warriors the other night, and thank God they won. Praise you, Lord. I'm sorry if that's sacrilegious. You think I'm joking. I'm actually being dead serious. I'm like, well, they're Christians. <laughs> I'm joking. I hope they are. But I really want them to win. Sorry. And, and I was sitting on a couch, drinking a Coke, eating nachos, talking about hustle. Yeah, literally, nachos on my belly with a soda, telling my son to get more snacks, and telling Draymond Green, you got to get on the ground for that ball, because it's easy when you're on the edge to be a critic. It's easy to tell people how to live their life. It's easy to tell people how to raise their kids when you don't have kids. When I was 19, I could raise your kids. Now my kids are 21 and 19. I'm just praying, God, help me. Because when you live on the edge of life, you become a critic of life. But when you step into the promises of God, when you step into the waters of God, you become a participant of life. You become an individual that says, okay, God, uh, you got me into this thing. You got to get me out of this thing. And God says, no problem. I've never failed you yet. I've always been with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I've got you. I'm your strong tower. I'm your refuge. Run to me and you'll find hope. You'll find strength. You'll find next. You'll find healing. See, that is the thing is if not careful, the church can become on the edge but not step into the promise. God will have our provision. Oh, we're going to heaven. We love God. But what is the action that we're taking? Where are we rising up as a church? Where are we rising up as men in our home? Where are we rising up as women of God? Where are we rising up as the next generation to declare the greatness and the goodness of Jesus Christ? What is it that God wants from our life? It will not happen from the edge of comfort. I have never gotten into better shape cheering on the Warriors. I gained six pounds the other night just stress eating. And you think if not careful, because you're around it, you are it. But you got to step into it. Just because you have a membership at the gym doesn't make you fit. Come on, somebody. Come on. Oh, I got a membership. Good for you. It's the, it's the engagement. It's engaging into what God wants. It's taking hold and not letting go. Believing that God wants to do more. That we keep stepping in. That, that, that we, we, we don't become bystanders, but we become partners. And the last thing, if you're going to rise up, you must stay connected to the presence of God. There's something to be said about the presence of God. That's why Sundays are so important. You know, when I hear people say, well, you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. All right, well, why do you want to go to heaven? I mean, isn't heaven going to be just singing and rejoicing and praising God? Hmm, it's kind of like church. Aren't we going to go to heaven and worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords? Aren't we going to become uh, um, individuals that, that, that for eternity were in the presence and the power of God? There's something unique. It's, it's amazing because, you know, they say from the flood or whatever the reason, but we cannot find the Garden of Eden. I, I know we have an idea where it was, but, but, but over the years, theologians still cannot Tell us this is the Garden of Eden exactly. Why? Because I believe it was more than a place. I believe it was an atmosphere. It was a place where Adam met God. 
found God, was supplied by God. It was an open heaven that God said when Jesus gave his life, the heavens opened back, the bridge was reassembled, that there was access to the throne, that, that God is here listening or wanting and awaiting us with his presence and with his power. That's why David cried out and said, Lord, as, as, the, as, as the deer panteth for water, so my soul, so my soul longs for you, O oh God. So my soul is after you. I, I, I got to have you, God. Why? Because his presence changes everything. Worship team, why don't you come? I believe God wants to move today through his presence. Because it's in his presence that we really understand his power. Here's Israel. It's such an amazing picture, right? Is the presence of God, they carry him into the middle of the Jordan and they stop. And when they stop, the water passes the miracle that everyone was hoping for that we declared was coming showed up. Why? Because those that had the presence of God stayed in the current. Can I tell you something? Sometimes life is a current. Sometimes you think you're going to get washed away, but when you're holding on to the anchor, when you're holding on to the chief cornerstone, when you keep the presence of God in your life, He'll keep you through storms that you didn't think you were going to go through. He'll keep your feet grounded in a current that seems like it's going to sweep you, but it can't because God's got you. You think you're holding on to the presence, but I want to tell you the presence is holding on to you. The presence has got a hold of your life, and it's going to put you in places that are bigger than you, stronger than you. But it's not stronger than the author and the perfecter of your faith, Jesus Christ. It's not stronger than that who, who assembled you and put you, knows exactly what you can navigate, that there's no temptation that you'll go through, that, that I will not leave a way of escape. There's no hardship that you'll navigate, that, that I won't give you the strength to walk it out. And I want to tell you, you may only have the presence, but the presence is enough. You, you may only be thinking, man, God, I don't know if I can weather this storm, but if you hold on to the presence, there's nothing that can defeat you. There's nothing that can overcome you. There's nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. It's all about His presence. If you get the picture in your mind, there's the Ark of the Covenant. Arcacia poles were through it, and they held it, and they carried it, and they stood in the middle of the current. And in the presence of God, they stood where they couldn't normally stand to create an opening, create an opportunity. They rose up to achieve something that they could not achieve on their own. That they didn't have the power to dam up the water and add them and stand in the current long enough to see the miracle. But they, 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 they didn't see it, but they believed because they were holding on to the presence of God. What happens, if not careful, is we go in with the presence, but when the turmoil comes, we grab something that's not His presence. But we try to grab hold of something of the world, to sustain us, something of the world that we think is going to empower us. If I just had more money, if I just had a relationship, if I just had someone to tell me I love you, if, if I just had this or that, then it would change. But it's not going to change by the physical. It's going to change because of his presence. His presence. His presence in your life. The presence of God changes everything. And there they stood with the presence of God. And it said that the Jordan dried up and Israel walked across into the promises of God. In where they would build a new way of life, where they would see God move like no other generation had seen God move. Why? Was it because they're, they, they, they got rode across, it's because they stayed in the presence that the Holy Spirit that 
God's presence was with them. And if you don't know this, I want you to know this before you go anywhere today. God's presence is with you. God's presence is for you. God's presence is after you. We sang that song. I'm going a, I'm to a re read the lyrics of the lyrics that I, that I love in that song, Reckless Love. When, when, when I sing that song, I'm already, if you've not noticed, somewhat energetic. But when I sing that song, it, I, it's like, it just overwhelms me. And when we're singing it, I, I love the portion that says that there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. It, it, it's declaring something. There's nothing that you won't do for me, but I've just got to stay in your presence. It's all about his presence. Now I'm going to ask you to stand this morning in the presence of God. We sat? Okay. Can I tell you something, Emily? Before we get going. When you were singing, I, I saw a picture. It was like a puzzle of pieces everywhere. And God was putting pieces back together for you. He was preparing a way for what's in your heart. Because sometimes what's in your heart, you think, how do I get it in my hands? Like, I know, God, what you want me to do, but how is this all going to work? Because he's the author of your life. That, that that's been shattered, the pieces that are out, God will gather them one at a time and he'll assemble all that he has for your life. Obviously, you have a gift, but more than a gift, you have a heart. Oh, you can sing, girl. Holy smokes, you can sing. But the heart in which you sing, it changes atmosphere. You watch, you'll sing, and people will get healed. They will get whole. They will come to Christ. Lives will be changed. Not just seeing or set an atmosphere so someone could speak. You're seeing because when you sing, things change. Because it's changed you. Sometimes all you had was a song, but it got you through. I'm telling you, it got you through. Your voice got you through broken moments, alone moments. No one knows those moments. They just get to see you in this moment. But God saw it. God saw you standing in the current and say, no, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to let go. I'm going to push forward because there's more on you. There's more on you. There's more on you. We, we got to rise up. As a church, there's a mandate for more in this house. There's a mandate not just for land. Land is great. Building a facility is awesome, but it's still about the presence. We are doing that because we believe the presence of God is here in a manner that's going to change more lives than this facility can handle. That God's presence and his power is going to change families to the magnitude that this place cannot hold us anymore. It cannot, it, 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 it cannot facilitate the passion in our heart. There's more. And if not careful, we will stand on the edge and declare and believe and love it and want it. But you got to just trust God and step in. You got to get into the current, hold on to his presence. And I just, I, I feel this strong today that there's some that you have been in the current. You feel like the current's going to take you. You're tired. Maybe you're broken. I know you'd show up to church with that big old Christian smile. Praise God! Sometimes you cry on your way home. No one knows what's going on in your life, but God does. And I'm telling you, His presence is going to get you through it. His presence is going to bring your kids back. 
his presence is going to heal your body. You, you may not see it, but you can believe that it's on its way. His miracles are on its way for your life. Not just believing for others, for you, for your family, for your marriage, for your kids, for, for your job, for your finances, for your affliction. It, it's on its way. That hope is on its way. Love is on its way. Healing is on its way. Wholeness is on its way. Restoration is on its way. That, that there's more for you. It's on its way. But you got to get in. You keep waiting. No, no, you don't know I've been hurt before. I, I know you've been hurt, but he's the healer. So just step in. I, I know I've been to church before, but I, I, I'm not sure. I know, but just step in. Just trust again. Just, just take another step a little bit deeper into his presence. And you're here. You're here this morning. And you're navigating a turbulent moment in your life, a turbulent season. But I'm telling you, God's in it. Oh, God's in it. God's with you. He's for you. He's about you. He, he's with you. You don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But I know. I know him. There's no mountain he won't climb up. <laughs> There's no lie he won't tear down. There's no room he won't light up. There's no wall he won't kick down. I mean, just, isn't that picture like just kicks open the door that you've closed yourself into and said, no, 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 I'm taking you out of this. In his presence, everything changes. And if you're in a season and you need God's presence to a greater degree, I'm asking you to step beyond the edge of being critical or uh, being hesitant. Say, no, no, I'm going to be childlike today, just like Christ said I should. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe you, David. I'm going to step in. And when you step in, I'm going to tell you something. It may not be instant, but it's on its way. His strength will be instant. His hope will be instant. His encouragement will be instant. It will get you to the place where you can stand again, fight again, believe again, hope again. That's for you. If that's you this morning, wherever you may be, I want you just to step out of wherever you are. And just step out. Step into this altar. Literally right now, if, if you need...